Should we all just buy Apple and be done with it? Welcome to Common Sense on the Prairie, a podcast by First National Wealth Management in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We are a regional best provider of wealth management services, including investment management and financial planning, as well as personal trust, institutional trust, and retirement plan services. This podcast is our chance to share some of our passions and help you make your money work for you. Welcome to episode 10. It's hard to believe we've already done 10 episodes. What started as a fun idea has really taken on a life of its own. And I appreciate each and every one of you for listening. And what an interesting year to launch a podcast. But then again, times of great upheaval tend to be the cradles of innovation. Today, we're going to dive into an investment topic that has taken on some real significance in 2020. We're going to discuss the FANG stocks and why they should matter to you. But before we get into that, let's get that disclaimer out of the way. Any comments, insights, or strategies discussed on this podcast are intended to be general in nature and therefore may not be suitable for you and your situation, whatever that may be. Before acting on anything we discuss, please consult with your attorney, CPA, and or your financial advisor. In order to properly to cover this topic, I brought in an expert to help me. Today, I'm joined by Matt Adamson from our investments team. Matt is a Sioux Falls native who received his undergraduate degree from the University of South Dakota and his MBA from the University of Nebraska. Matt is a CFA charter holder and is one of our uber-talented portfolio managers. He works with individuals, retirement plans, and not-for-profits of all sizes. In addition, Matt volunteers his time with several local organizations for which he lends his investment expertise. But most importantly, Matt is married to Stacy, and like me, Matt is a hashtag girl dad. Welcome to the pod, Matt. Thanks, Adam. Now, you've got three daughters, correct? Yep. Three right. little daughters. Three little daughters. All less. five and younger. So. Okay. God yep. bless you. Don and I didn't have the <laughs> stomach to keep going after two. So, yep. all right, Matt, let's start with the basics. I mentioned in the open that we're going to talk about the FANG stocks today. What exactly are the FANG stocks? Yeah. So FANG is an acronym. Um, pretty straightforward. The stocks in that are Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And they've had pretty incredible returns over the last few years. And so, and for our discussion, I'm going to add another stock. We're going to talk about Microsoft too, because okay. they're in there, but I'm not going to throw off the acronym. Yeah, we, we, catchy, say we have so. to change the acronym now. <laughs> not that powerful. <laughs> okay. Sorry, All right. <laughs> so what makes these stocks so special? Like, why are we talking about them? Yeah. So, and I think they're pretty common household names, so this won't surprise anyone, but they have been by far the winners of kind of this new digital economy that we find ourselves in and their returns have been absolutely incredible. So I just pulled these this morning. We'll rattle these off quick. You've got 47%, 80%, 80%, 69%, 35%, and then 51% uh, return for Microsoft over the last year, which is just pretty incredible relative to the market. Jeez. Um, and then combine this with the fact that these are absolutely massive companies. Apple is the biggest one, and they flirt pretty much daily with the $2 trillion market cap. So wow. um, that's that's bigger than the output of a lot of countries. Right. So that's um, pretty incredible. And then what's happened because they've had such outsized returns is that they've gotten even bigger relative to the market as a whole. So if you look at it now, the top five stocks in the S&P 500, which you think could be pretty diversified. Yeah. They make up almost a quarter of the value of that index, just those five companies. So that's incredibly high. Yeah. And then when you look at other indexes, another popular one being the NASDAQ 100, that number goes up to almost 50%, Jeez. which is really quite incredible. Wow. I mean, it sounds like these stocks have been on an absolute tear this year, but I can't help but feel like we've been here before. To me, in some ways, this feels a little bit like a concentrated version of the tech craze of the late 90s. Is that fair or is there more to it than that? Yeah. Well, there's always more to it, right? So yeah. things are always a little bit different. But first off, I'll say you're not the only one making that connection. There's okay. a lot of uh, well, people. Glad I'm not alone. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people thinking that right now. And, you know, as always, only time will tell. Sure. You know, you can only really see a bubble afterwards, but there's a lot of elements that seem to match up. So the big thing, you have returns that are very concentrated in a handful of stocks and in a pretty specific sector. So mm -hmm. that's very similar. You also have, coincidentally, a lot of value investors. Value as a strategy, which has done really well long term, has really done awful. In fact, the latest three-year stretch is the worst three-year stretch going back about 80 years. So oh, really? it's, okay. it's pretty crazy, which also was similar to the tech bubble. You had sure. value really fall out of favor. 
And you also have stock prices going up a lot faster than fundamentals. And I'll, I'll share this. Um, this was an interview that Joel Greenblatt of Gotham Funds did okay. um, with a guy named Barry Reholtz. And he said, if you bought, and I, I don't know the exact ending date for this, but if it's any time in the last three months, it's, the market's been pretty flat. So he said, if you bought every company that lost money in 2019 and that had a market cap over a billion dollars, that's about 261 companies. And you bought every single one of those companies, you'd be up 65% so far this year. So that's a year to date number. Again, I don't have the final amount, yeah. but that's, that's sounds like the tech bubble, right? Yeah. It's a little, little scary. The one caveat that you have now with these really big companies, like I mentioned Facebook, Apple, Amazon, these really are very profitable companies and have real fast growing earnings streams. So that's sure. kind of the caveat to this is that these are really mature, very profitable companies. But the problem is that as fast as they're growing earnings, their stock price is growing even faster. And so you're starting to pay a very big premium for that earnings growth. So I guess it's a long way of saying, yes, I do think it's a fair comparison, but every time is always unique. So yeah. I always caution anyone to say, you can see a pattern, but it's always a little bit different. And, you know, I, I wouldn't overplay that. Theme, right. Yeah. Obviously. In the late 90s, it felt like none of those companies made money. But if you had .com on the end of the name, it seemed like it did really well, mm -hmm. but everything was unprofitable. Mm -hmm. You hear these stories about the amount of cash that these big companies have. And so I think that's maybe one big distinguishing factor is, yep. you know, you'd mention these companies are incredibly profitable and mm -hmm. they just kick off gobs of cash, yep. which is, I think, different than yep. the late 90s. Absolutely. So you've mentioned how big these top five in particular companies or top handful of companies are in relative terms to the rest of the market. Is, is that the mm -hmm. first time in history that this has happened or is, is this something we've seen before? Yeah. So I think, I think there's two flavors of that with the two things we talked about. And that's where, have we ever had such a small number of companies represent a big portion of the market? Um, and the answer to that is yes. Okay. Um, we did during the tech bubble, which yep. again doesn't sound great. Right. Um, but before that, you have to go all the way back to the 50s. And so from the 30s to the 50s, we had a pretty small group that made up a pretty big percentage. Um, so it's happened, but it's definitely not not the norm sure. to be that big, certainly not recently. And then the second part just being kind of, is it unique for a handful of companies to outperform the market? And that's, that's pretty normal. Yeah, um, that, sure. That's not surprising at all. But what is really unique is that those companies are the biggest of the big, you know, um, kind of these mega cap names. And frankly, normally that relationship's actually reversed where oh, once okay. you get to a really big size, it becomes very hard to outperform the market. So to have both of those is really unique mm -hmm. and it, it brings some interesting challenges for investors too. Sure. So I guess my follow-up question there would be, are there dangers to investing too heavily in these large stocks or are these companies just going to keep getting bigger? Yeah. So the short answer is yes. And then generally, no, they don't. I'd say if your goal is to perform well relative to the market as a whole, then buying the biggest companies usually doesn't work out. We have some research from Dimensional Fund Advisors that kind of bears this out, where they, they're going to compare the returns of the top 10 stocks in the United States before, in the years leading up, before they reach the top 10, and then after they reach the top 10. And as you might expect, the returns are very high in the years leading up to that top 10 appearance. And that makes sense, right? Yeah. The math of it is that the only way you get to be in the top 10 is to grow faster than everything else in the sure. index. So yep. makes sense. as you might imagine, backward looking, these stocks have phenomenal returns. But the question for investors is, well, what about now? Because you're buying them now, you know, right. presumably. So how do they do? And on average, over the next five to 10 years, that underperformance is about one to one and a half percent. Oh, annual underperformance for those groups. Okay. Um, and I think that makes sense. If you just think about once you get that big, you can't steal market share when you are the market or right. you're the market leader. There's just kind of a law of gravity that starts to apply. Sure. And then another danger that again is kind of similar to the tech bubble is that there's a huge, really big industry concentration at the top right now. Mm -hmm. And so there's less real kind of economic diversification in those names um, sure. than you normally might have. So I, I, I want to put that in there too as a potential risk. And by industry diversification, you mean, so right now it's all in tech by and large. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. We've always preached the importance of diversification. And, you know, in other words, we're, we're spreading out our investment dollars between multiple asset classes, domestically, internationally, small caps, large caps, et cetera. But if I'm being honest, that approach has felt a bit 
foolish, particularly this year. 